So could you just uh, inform us a little bit about what does the term spiritual competency exactly mean? It's really the how do uh, mental health professionals, I'm a clinical psychologist, but everything about this applies across the board to counselors and social workers and nurses and so on. And, you know, we know spirituality is an important part of um, many of our clients' lives. Uh, and uh, at times it's been a barrier where some underserved populations won't access conventional mental health professionals because they're not trained in how to be, uh, how to incorporate their spirituality, which is a core strength of theirs, into their healing, the work they may need to do on a mental or a physical problem. So it's been this barrier. And there's been times where psychology has really been, uh, has pathologized or certainly ignored uh, religion. My training included nothing about it. Um, so there was this gap, and uh, I became aware of it, particularly in regard to the area of spiritual crisis because of a, some lived experience that I had. But it, as I got more and more into that work, it culminated in acceptance of a DSM-4 definition for religious or spiritual problems. And that was to really acknowledge the role of spiritual crises as uh, to distinguish them from psychotic disorders and so on, which had been my goal. But as I, you know, work in the mental health field, I got asked to do workshops on religious and spiritual problems, for example. And spiritual crisis is only one type of a religious or spiritual problem. Uh, another type is uh, the experience of loss of faith in one's life for some mm -hmm. whose religion may have been very important and then they have an experience where they lose that faith. Um, and there are anomalous experiences people have that also might throw them off and create a problem in their life that uh, they would consult a therapist about. So it's a very broad area of religious or spiritual problem. So I began to see, you know, to incorporate issues of grief, how do you work with dying patients, you know, and so on. So the whole area broadened and I began to see that there was a pretty wide range of uh, competencies that uh, psychologists should acquire in order to address religious and spiritual problems. And another aspect of that is that there are times people have, the reason that it's not, I, I broadened in from religious and spiritual problems to spiritual competency is because there's also times where a person doesn't have a problem with it, it's an asset, a strength in their life. And if you're working with them on something else, you can harness that strength of theirs into the work. Uh, but you have to understand something about it and its role as a positive coping strategy and how to show, how to connect with the client around this, how to build a therapeutic alliance around this. Uh, how do you show respect and appreciation, which is foundational to doing all the things I was just talking about. Yeah. Uh, and therapists aren't trained in that. Could you give us some exa examples of the different spiritual competencies? We took several years to develop this concept and conducted okay. several studies to develop this concept. So if you, when you go look at Wikipedia on competencies and it'll give you a little history of it, that's how I started, to figure out, well, how do you establish something as a competency? That became a goal mm -hmm. of, of my work. And um, so the first thing you have to do is to format that competency along the lines of knowledge, skills, and attitudes or values. Those three things are part of every way that, like multicultural competencies, ethnic service competencies. You look at, at across fields, it's not even limited to the mental health field. If you talk about competencies, there are knowledge, skills, and these attitudes and values. So I took a, a step of saying, well, then in that case, you know, what would be the attitudes and values? Okay, so one of the values would clearly be showing respect. So that is one. Okay, and I, I generated, you know, knowledge, knowledge of different uh, uh, the major world's religious traditions, uh, 
you know, a whole bunch of factors, uh, skills being able to conduct a spiritual assessment with a client, mm -hmm. uh, which is foundational to we're doing work in any of these areas. Okay, so I came up with a personal opinion about this. Then uh, somebody who was a former student of mine, Cassie Deaton, who's the president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, okay. uh, took this and uh, put together a team of researchers and we did a four-stage study to validate these. So we, we started with my list and convened a focus group of people who had a very strong background, publications, and training, and mindfulness, and meditation teachers, and a wide range of people with different kinds of expertise to spend a day together with us. After we had actually, I didn't mention that, done an extensive literature review, so we brought this focus group together, we refined it, then we created a survey from the best product that we experts could do with the literature, blah, 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 Year, decades, hundreds of years of experience. We then brought it to a much wider range, 189, I believe, uh, psychologists who had some expertise in religion and spirituality, well, you know, unlike many psychologists who are atheists or agnostics, Mm -hmm. uh, these were psychologists who had some interest in religion and spirituality. So we validated this, this validating meaning we reduced it from like 24 to like ultimately 16. You know, it was a refining process. Okay. Then we wanted to get a more general sample of psychologists. So what we did is we rented a booth at the American Psychological Association okay. and had a giveaway of five iPads for filling out a survey. So we were getting a much, much wider range. They weren't people, had no interest in religious spirituality, but the questions did, but they didn't necessarily. And we got, you know, we looked at their attitudes about core, what are the core competencies and so on. So then we, based on that, we published two articles in peer reviewed journals with these criteria. So that they have a lot of validity. Cassie Beaton and Shelley Scammell, who were key researchers in this uh, process, published a book on religious uh, and spiritual competencies. Um, there's still the stigma here in Brazil, and I think in other parts of the U.S., and that maybe outside San Francisco, that if you're sort of interested in spiritual topics, that you're not particularly scientific or scientifically rigorous. And it sounds like, you know, you and your team have done a very rigorous job of getting these competencies down with lots of research you know, based on opinions of people, you know, especially psychologists in the field. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we were kind of synthesizers. We, our research was to validate the competencies. The competencies are based on, you know, hundreds and hundreds of research studies showing why these things are critical for right. a um, competent yeah. and health professional. So scientific in a sociological sense, really, because you're really, you're gathering the data, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about, yeah. Yeah, okay. surveys are, are not laboratory data. They are social data. Yeah. Right, right. And so you started this work in the late 80s, early 90s? When, when did it start? Well, I would say it started after the DSM category, because before that I was one of many transpersonal psychologists interested in this area of spiritual crisis. But with the DSM category, um, I, I got asked to, you know, do workshops at all kinds of places because I would also publish on spiritual crises and so on. Yeah. And when did the DSM category get recognized? What year was that? That was 1994. 1994. Okay. Okay. So that, that's the beginning of my starting to look more broadly. Okay. Yeah. And so in the beginning, how was this work received by the mainstream? Who were you bringing it to? Who are you introducing it to? And how was it at least initially for you? Yeah, here, spirituality is part of mainstream treatment at Kaiser's and uh, uh, county mental health departments. I've been involved in a, what's called a mental health and spirituality initiative, where we have somebody in each county. There are 58 counties in California. 
mm -hmm. is a uh, mental health and spirituality liaison, somebody who knows the relig religious and spiritual resources in their county and can help uh, their patients access them and even bring in some of these outside groups and help them as a mental health professional, you know, bring in religious and spiritual uh, groups to help, uh, you know, meet speak clients' spiritual needs. Oh, okay. So, so bring you know, some of the, this has resulted in some funding, for example, in some of the counties which have Native American populations. There's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, going back to their ancestral ritual, uh, you know, sweat lodges and stuff like that specifically and learning the, what's called the medicine wheel uh, specifically as a way to cut down on addictions and mm -hmm. substances and that's that there are some research articles showing that that does work for that population the mm -hmm. sweat lodge is conducted in a very ceremonial set way there's not that much variation it's always four quarters and certain prayers are said and so on so it's a very structured approach but, but at the same time you're saying that the mental health departments and the government in california is funding sweat lodges correct yeah. yep if you trace it back you that's absolutely true yep they weren't doing that in 94, though, were they? It wasn't that developed back then. No, no. Uh, I think there has been a, a, a shift in attitudes about this, and spirituality is seen as a strength. And does it ever, is there ever an issue of spirituality or spiritual practices replacing psychiatry or psychiatric medications? Or is, is there tension there, or is there cooperation? I think what we're looking at now is an era of integrative health approaches. It would mean collaboration rather than competition. And, and many people have both uh, mental health slash psychiatric needs and spiritual needs. It means that there are times I've collaborated with uh, a chaplain at the San Francisco VA Medical Center, and we led a group called Finding Your Higher Power. And we had many patients who were in 12-step programs, but many of them were really struggling to find that sense of connection to a higher power. Mm -hmm. And I led, a, I led a group once with a rabbi that we, we explored patients' religious or spiritual uh, delusions and hallucinations. They were totally invited to talk about what they had experienced in this domain. I, I actually held these groups off the unit together with the rabbi, you know, and a lot came out about their experiences of uh, having visions that they'd never been able to share, it's about who they were, that, you know, they, they wanted to be the starting point of a conversation, but if you got through that, there was a real person there that you could relate to. So these groups really liberated a lot of energy, interpersonal energy. The staff noticed that when these patients came back on the unit, they were talking with each other, they were talking with the staff, and that had not been happening before. Yeah. So, um, and also, you, know, you mentioned that word integrative. The, the caption for our conference is an integral vision. It's the idea of what happens to these people who are currently, you know, in silos, in the psychiatric silo, the psychology silo, shamanic silo, or spiritual silo, uh, the peer support silo. What happens if you get them talking to each other, finding out where the common ground is, what works in what situation? You know, I, I like to be able to share these examples because it shows what's possible. It is not the mainstream. And, okay. Uh, most of mental health treatment is cognitive behavioral and okay. medication. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, we've been able to, as part of this initiative, and there really is an initiative, a group of consumers and uh, some religious professionals. We have a few ministers of various kinds, many of whom are also mental health professionals, like social workers and so on. So, uh, we had a very mixed, uh, diverse group that has, uh, we met to create this initiative. We got some funding from the counties to do it. And then we've held also conferences 
where we brought people together. We've held three conferences where we've had that. The third of the group is consumers. A third of the group are mental health professionals and a third of them are religious professionals. And so it really allows for a, a lot of dialogue. Uh, do you have any advice or experience in how to sort of break down those barriers between yourself, your work, the integral vision, and the current mainstream model of cognitive therapy and meds? Well, I think it's the way a movement like this will succeed is through, uh, I think, a lot of people like you who really have the savvy to get this into various uh, different kinds of media. Uh, and that's a really key way to get things out. I, I published about 80 articles and journals and stuff. Those don't get to see much light of day compared to somebody like your uh, bipolar awakening videos that I Thank think you. have really yeah. uh, had a, you know, an impact on people's understanding very widely. So, you know, I think that kind of thing. And then, you know, doing the academic stuff that I like to do really helps. And uh, I have a couple of research articles on spirituality as a, a self-identified consumer need. 80% of consumers say yes, they do want spirituality incorporated into it. 80%. That's a mm -hmm. lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And that's based on surveys we've conducted. And so as more and more, you know, sort of that whole thing about paradigms, you know, chain mm -hmm. one one funeral at a time. <laughs> I don't think that that's in the scientific world. You know, people who yeah. believe in older paradigm in physics, they never stop reading, including Einstein. He hated quantum physics. He okay. thought that was just total nonsense. So there's going to be a cultural movement. And then as the culture moves, then we'll be more receptive to these ideas. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else you'd like to add? Everything is kind of a work in progress. So if, uh, you know, any of the people watching have uh, any access, uh, any clout to implement things, you know, uh, to just go ahead and uh, start doing that. And... Uh, you know, be part of this movement to be more spiritually inclusive.